Okay. So um, in the previous, in the Stanford slide deck, actually, um, the first te slides are about the previous lecture. So actually, we're jumping to the, the 11th slide in this. Um, so basically, what we want to do is um, think about what we are going to uh, deal with natural language in the sense of having structure in language. So uh, if you look at the original uh, word embedding model that we discussed in the first couple of lectures, basically we have ways of representing individual words, right? We can um, put Germany close to France and um, Monday close to Tuesday by looking at the context of all the words, uh, looking at the word windows and then compiling them into a set of dimensions, maybe 50 dimensions, maybe 300 dimensions, and embedding them appropriately. But uh, those are for single words. Now, if we want to represent more than a single word, let's say a phrase or um, uh, a sentence, what we can do is uh, continue with what we have done previously and use um, recurrent neural nets, right, which is basically a linear chain. But the problem with a, a linear chain is that uh, you get only one representation at the end. And oftentimes in natural language processing, you have um, constituents, you know, um, blocks or phrases that have semantic meaning. And instead of just building a final representation of the entire sentence, what we want to do is build representations of chunks of words, uh, phrases, if you will, uh, as we go on. So when we do that, uh, we can think about uh, a phrase like this one down here that uh, is on the slide, the country of my birth or the place where I was born, and think that these two phrases mean very similar things, and we'd want to put them in the same uh, place uh, in this uh, word embedding space. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the word embedding model here, just represented in two dimensions, but obviously could be up to k dimensions, like 50 or 300, and embed um, these phrases somewhere. So um, in the slides, uh, they get placed here and here uh, with some score, right? 1, 5, or 1, 1. 1.1 and 4. So the basic idea is to still take the word embedding model, but embed now in phrases or larger syntactic units into this model. Okay? So it, it seems a little intuitive that you would want to use the word embedding model and then still embed other things inside of that. But actually, it sort of makes sense because in many languages, um, in different languages, you have concepts that are actually multi-word units. You know, um, there are lots of uh, phrases or words in other languages um, that map to entire sentences in another language. And um, some, sometimes you have to express uh, something in English with many, many words, which in, for example, in Ch Chinese or Tamil would only be one word, okay? So we can think of this uh, vector space model, um, in this word vector space model as being a, a complete uh, semantic space in which we're not just placing individual words, but, um, you know, it could be arbitrarily sized text units, okay? But the important intuition here is that we want them to be Phrases, you know, they need to be uh, something that we recognize uh, as a constituent having meaning. Whereas if you take a recurrent neur neural network, okay, and you think about, you know, running for X timestamps, right, for a word one through word, uh, I don't know, five, for example, and taking those five words together, those five words don't necessarily form a constituent. They don't necessarily conform as a phrase, right? So, for example, later on in the slide, you'll see some examples of um, two words next to each other, like of, the, which are a parts of a phrase, but not a phrase by themselves. So, actually, it wouldn't make sense to uh, give a score to that, okay? So uh, we'll start over here on this part of the slide, okay? So if you look at uh, this, we were talking about single word vectors, right? Uh, putting them into a, a, a embedding model, uh, as we did in the first two lectures. And there are lots of other ways to do this. Uh, we can do this based on um, semantic uh, similarity using fasori, uh, manually compiled meaning from um, clusters of words. So the brown cluster is a basically a set of uh, word clusters that uh, are derived from a corpus called the brown corpus. It's one of the very early corpora when people had to actually manually compile things. It only has a million words. So compare that to all the gigaword corpus corpora that we're using 
in, in building distributed word representations which have, you know, billions or trillions of tokens. Okay, so um, single word vectors are a way to, to map this uh, word embedding space uh, using distributional techniques, but uh, they don't really work uh, quite right if you're looking at longer phrases. Okay. On the other hand, if you took, um, if you've taken, let's say, an IR course, an information retrieval course, we ha typically have a very different definition of what we mean by a, a vector for a document, right? In that type of representation, if you learned this in undergraduate IR, it would be a one-hot vector, right? Basically, we have a vector that's uh, of the dimensionality of the vocabulary. So, for example, in English, we might have 30,000 or 50,000 different individual words. So each document has a, a vector of size 30,000 or 30 or 50,000. And we would just put um, non-zero values in all the spots where there are actual occurrences of those words. So, for example, if the, the first dimension represented the word da, then we would have maybe a one or two or three there, depending on how many occurrences of the word da that you see. And similarly for all of the other words, okay? So actually, that works really well already. If you, if you know information retrieval, using one hot document vectors works very well for informa information retrieval. You don't need to do a lot. Um, you can use that to induce topicality, and that's typically what an IR engine does. You know, you type in a query, and you want to find documents about that topic, but not necessarily answering a question, right? So you're just uh, putting in keywords, and you hope to find other documents with the same types of keywords. Okay, so that works fine for IR, but uh, a key point in all of this is we're not thinking of uh, any word order, no detailed understanding, no semantics, right? Because in a one-hot vector model, we just know which words occur in a document. We have no idea of the semantics, and uh, we don't care about the word order. We don't capture that as part of the IR uh, model of a bag of words, okay? So somewhere in between this idea of a, a single word model and a document word model is what we're going after here because natural language comprises of a, a set of um, phrases, right? We don't put a uh, word salad in our sentences. We need to organize them. And when we organize them, we, we don't typically have free word order. There's some type of restriction on our word order that gives us the semantics of the task. So if you look at the top part of the side, it says basically we need vectors for representing both phrases and sentences where the word order matters that leads to certain semantics, right? Okay. So then what we want to do is uh, put our sequences of words into the same vector space model, um, this word embedding model. And the idea is to use this notion of the principle of compositionality. So uh, does everyone here know what a parse is, a parse of a sentence? Okay. A parse of a sentence is basically uh, the structure of the sentence, right? So it's represented at the bottom of this slide here. So I have the country, which is a noun phrase, right? My birth, which is a noun phrase, of my birth, which is uh, we can say a prepositional phrase. And then when I combine this subject noun phrase with my prepositional phrase, then I have a complete set, uh, a complete uh, noun phrase uh, here, a larger one, which consists of a, a simplex noun phrase, a simple noun phrase with a preposition, the country of my birth. Okay, And we can go on to uh, derive, let's say, a representation for a sentence, a representation for a sentence with adjuncts, other things like that, that are just basically composed of smaller units, okay? So in parsing, there's several different styles of natural language parsing. The one that we're talking about today is called uh, constituent parses, okay? It means that um, each internal node in this tree corresponds to a semantic unit that you and I can understand, right? So this uh, highlight over here is a prepositional phrase, so we all know what that means. But for example, if I take of my, and uh, use this as a two gram, that wouldn't make sense as a phrase, right? Because it's missing something. It's missing, for example, the, the noun at the end, okay? So that's not a constituent. We wouldn't assign that a phrase. So um, that's why uh, a constituent parse tree has internal nodes that represent things that uh, we can agree upon as having semantics, okay? So what we're going to do is then uh, 
use this uh, principle of compositionality to put together vectors that represent these uh, compositional phrases, right? These phrases that have uh, meaning, okay? And we're going to derive both a score for whether that phrase is a, a, a candidate a set of words is a good phrase and whether um, and where they are in this um, d-dimensional uh, word embedding, right? So here I've derived uh, uh, 2.5 and 3.8 as the values for the first two dimensions for this particular vector uh, that is a, a noun phrase representing my birth. Okay, so we need to uh, do these two things, right? We have to say that we're going to find the meaning of the words and that's indicated by the score of these things, okay? And the rules that combine them together, which is going to tell us that that's a phrase, right? And so uh, when we uh, run through this, then we can derive um, finally, for example, a, a phrase meaning by putting it in the vector space, okay? Yeah. You could say that. You could say that there's some type of summary quality of words that are close to sentences. For example, mailman might be a word, but I could also write, you know, something like a phrase like the person who delivers my mail, mm -hmm. right? And what we hope is that those two constituents, one being a single word and one being a phrase, would live in the same part of the vector space, right? So for example, here is Germany. I can say the place, uh, the country that, uh, Germans come from, right? And we hope that that's in the same general location as Germany. Well, that's what we hope to get, yes. Yeah. So uh, if we uh, have some constraint for the meaning, then we can try to uh, um, regularize and try to uh, do back propagation to guarantee that they might be in the same place. But we'll talk about that later. Most of the time when we do the uh, our recursive neural network training, we're mostly looking at the structure, uh, guaranteeing for the structure by imposing some penalty. But that, I think, uh, Uma will talk about later. Does that answer your question? Uh, I don't think so, but uh, we'll cover that later, yeah. Okay, so this is what we want. Uh, we want to be able to say that uh, I have a sentence like the one below, the cat sat on the mat, and I have the individual embeddings for all of these words, right? And what I want to be able to do is induce this type of tree structure where I can say the cat is a noun phrase because it semantically makes sense as a, a phrase, uh, and we're going to type it as a noun phrase. And the mat is also a case where I have two adjacent words and it composes of a noun phrase, right? On the mat, when I add on to the left of the mat, then I get a prepositional phrase. If I get sat on front of that, then I get a, a verb phrase. And if I aggregate the first noun phrase with the verb phrase that comes afterwards, I get a sentence, okay? But we also want this, right? We want uh, to be able to find the meaning of each of these things, so I need to do uh, I need to run a procedure that will learn both the structure of the sentence as well as the representation or semantic meaning of the sentence in terms of the vector embedding uh, model that we talked about in the first two lectures. So um, one question that's posed is, do we really need to learn this structure? Because as we have talked about in the last couple of lectures, you can actually learn this from a uh, recurrent neural net, right? This chain structure that we've been talking about. So why would we bother with something that's slightly different? Anyways, what is the difference between a recursive neural net and a recurrent neural net? Okay, the recurrent neural net we've covered in the last couple of slide, uh, last couple of weeks. Basically, this is just a linear chain structure, right? So I have this structure down at the bottom where I'm aggregating the individual words um, into a semantic representation that represents what is coming out of that 
up to a certain time point, right? So I have here uh, uh, this um, and this. So at this point, I would be storing the uh, word representation, uh, sorry, the semantic representation of the first two words, the country, right? And then the country of, which again, we are arguing is not a phrase, okay? It's just some aggregation of three words that happen to be adjacent to each other the country of my and the country of my birth. So at this point here, we can say we have some type of representation of the entire phrase. Okay, and we can output that uh, or use it for other things, right? So um, here, it's almost the same idea, right? Uh, in fact, if you look at the first two steps, the country here, we're outputting some type of uh, semantic representation that is really equivalent, right? So we have the first two words aggregated together um, these are slightly different just because your initialization is a little bit different here, right? Okay, so we have a uh, initialized vector uh, and then put it into a, a second vector where we are observing this word country and aggregating it with the first. Here we're just taking the first two words and aggregating it to a single phrase representation, right? Okay, so um, when we do it this way, we're getting a representation at the end that represents the entire phrase, and same here. But here, um, in this recursive style, meaning it's more general than a recurrent style, right? The recurrent style, style is just basically a linear chain. You can think of it as a, a tree like this, but um, instead of having these connections here, we would have them a, a little bit like, oops, um, represented uh, so that you would connect all of these in the left branching tree, right? For each word, uh, like the of would be connected to the country here, then my would be con uh, connected to the country of, etc. So you can view a recursive neural network as a more general model that uh, allows you to grow tree structures rather than the simple linear chain model, okay? So why would that be helpful or why would that be more uh, accurate, let's say, than using the recursive, uh, sorry, the recurrent model on the bottom. Mutu? Uh, I'd like to make a uh, make just you find some misunderstanding or understanding that other people might have. So, in terms of structure, the recursive and the recurrent neural networks have fundamental difference. In that, the recurrent neural networks have a feedback loop, while the recursive neural networks don't, right? Okay. So, I think the the motivation behind this structure is that recurrent neural networks should capture long-term dependencies, whereas recursive neural networks are designed for composition. Uh, to, uh, yeah, so composition, you want to capture composition. So that motivates both these different ideas. I, I don't know why, recurrent, why why someone would come up with the recurrent neural networks to uh, encompass uh, the composition of a sentence and similar things. Okay, so Mutu has highlighted something very important, is that a recursive neural network, the one on the top, allows uh, compositionality, right? That we have individual structures. So when we want to reuse some of these structures, let's say I want to uh, know something about this particular noun phrase for processing later, then I would want to be able to have a semantic representation of it that's uh, not necessarily derived from something like this, which is an amalgamation of all of the words up to that time point. Okay, so that's a, a very important point. So it's, the idea is that when you need to combine certain pieces or elements together, right, to compose them to get an answer, then you would prefer to have a recursive structure because you can assign a semantic value to something that is a, a structure on its own. Okay? You have a question? Um, how is this constructed? Is it because of okay, so we'll cover that. There's a basically a, a, a greedy algorithm that's described in the lecture notes uh, in, in the following slides. So yeah, it's not very clear at this point how this tree structure arises because there's uh, possibly many different trees that could come from this, but we want something that looks a little bit like this, right? Uh, it can be based on training data. So if you have training data where you already have uh, a parse tree that's given to you, okay, somebody's assigned a tree, a structure, then you can use that to train the model to prefer trees that look like the ones that come from your training data. Okay?
Oh yeah, I don't think the numbers are real at all. They're just placeholders. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I think this is an artifact of the example. It's not. I don't think it's derived from any real real data. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it it remains to be seen. There are some applications where if you're working in a natural language application and you need. Uh, some structure information or you have some problem where certain subparts of phrases are conserved over multiple examples, then maybe you would recur re uh, prefer a recursive model. Okay. I don't think one performs that much better than the other. Why we were uh, seeing semantic representation and structural representation as two different things? Uh, your structural representation should uh, ultimately represent semantics. That's the idea of natural language processing. Okay? Your constituent parse tree may not do that. Constituent parse, uh, parse tree is more grammatical. It represents the grammar in the sentence. Okay? Whereas dependency parses and other higher level uh, semantic parses do represent the structure as well as the semantics. Okay, so when such knowledge-induced representations are available, it makes more sense to make use of them than to use uh, chunks of words and try to combine them use, uh, randomly using recursive or whatever you're Does that make sense? Okay, in, in, in cases where your training data also has a lot of uh, phrases that is conserved, all right, then you would maybe want to prefer recursive structure. Let's pretend, let's say, my corpora has a lot of noun phrases that include the um, phrase my birth, right? Then if I just have a, a sentence level representation using a, a recurrent network, I never derive a structure for the, the phrase my birth, right? So um, there we would want to make sure that uh, the representation of my birth across several sentences is uniform, right? Languages where uh, there's a co strong conjugation between uh, your uh, what is your linguistic structures and and, uh, and the vocabulary. But English is a weakly conjugated language. For example, French, which is a more regular and uh, strongly conjugated language, where there is a strong connection between your article and your word, as well as the form the verb takes after your noun. Okay, in those cases, I think what Min suggests is, is actually will be very more useful and very effective. Okay, so both are true. In, in these types of uh, recursive networks, what we need to guarantee is that we're outputting a structure that is contiguous. All right, so um, that's a very important property of how the current uh, recursive nets work. Okay, so for example, if you have some dependency where um, the word representation has some gaps, like I might have this word, this word, and then skip some words, and then this word, then combine them together to make a meaning, that is not going to work in this type of uh, network. Okay, so uh, Mutu was pointing out about morphemes, right? So in certain languages, you have conjugation or parts of a word that mean something. And for example, in machine translation, in many uh, languages where uh, there's very complex morphology, for example, Scandinavian languages are like that. They have a lot of chunks. And if you take, uh, for example, German, German has noun phrases that don't have spaces. Basically, they're all the noun parts strung together. You have to cut up the word to come up with morphemes, individual things that have semantic meaning. And then you would use uh, 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 some type of uh, recursive neural net on the morphemes rather than the words, okay? Because you're composing the morphemes to get a semantic, to get the semantics of the the words. If you have a database with a regular structure like this, like a lot of examples, like the country of my birth. Okay, at the uh, top, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Like a shallow representation like this instead of having a neural network. I mean, 
So that's a really good question. I'm not sure of the answer. I believe the reason why we do it uh, this way, uh, using a recursive neural net, is so that you can associate uh, some semantics with the arguments as well. So for example, if I take of here, right, of is this word, but it's looking for um, a noun phrase on the right hand side, right? So if we just take uh, of my birth and try to put it together, we'll have a representation for that phrase through word to vec. But uh, in this representation, we have some notion that there is um, a particular type of object being associated with the of. I'm not really sure whether I'm answering your question. Yeah, but if you can just put only my birth together and create a word to vec, mm -hmm. and later compose it with of to create another word to vec, um, like that builds a kind of like it, it could, but the, again, the thing is. So that's right here. Okay, taking that one step farther, we'll get to this example in a minute, is like say we had my birth as a, a word to vec. Okay, let's say we, we, we treat it as a, a, a single word, we gather all of the context and we train the model for it, then I have a representation of my birth. Now if I concatenate it or find some way to feed it through with of, will I get the same thing as this? Right? And the answer is no, because you know, of my birth is saying that these three words are occurring in this particular order. Right? If I just compose them together, it's not necessarily that my birth uh, is following of, it could be any, any order. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we need to, if we want to capture that in our application, then it's important to do it in this recursive style. So that's a really good question. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, for a long time in natural language process, uh, processing, people have been looking at the structure of language going back uh, many decades uh, uh, before Chomsky and other people, and uh, a lot of questions have uh, come up about is language actually recursive. We think of a noun phrase having rules that can embed other noun phrases. So in English you can have an infinitely long noun phrase just by embedding more noun phrases and, uh, inside of each other. Uh, I mean, some nursery rhymes are like that. The cat that ate the mouse, that ate the cheese, that ate the insect, you know, uh, all those types of things like that. Right? So um, it's still, the debate is still out whether uh, people are processing like that or not. But it really does help uh, when we look at the semantics of a language, uh, as Uma just uh, talked about. Here we have two sentences, right? He eats spaghetti with a spoon, and he eats spaghetti with meat. The spaghetti with meat here, the prepositional phrase with meat, is modifying spaghetti. So it's a property of the spaghetti, so it's actually a noun phrase, spaghetti with meat. Right? On the other side here, we have eat spaghetti with a spoon. The with a spoon is obviously not modifying spaghetti. It's not spaghetti with lots of little spoons inside. Right? It's the instrument in which we are using to eat the spaghetti, so it modifies the verb. Right? So this type of attachment uh, can be disambiguated with this type of sentence structure. But if we were to use uh, what was suggested earlier and just use a word to vec model, we'd lose this uh, uh, instrument. Right? So um, you can take any sentence, even if it has the exact same words, like the, man's, uh, the girl saw the man with a telescope. Did she see the man who has a telescope, or did she use the telescope to see the man? Right? And uh, even though these contain the exact same words, the tree structure is different for both of the variants. Okay? And um, we would need to uh, use a recursive version of a neural net to assign the correct parse structure. Obviously, both parse structures are valid. It just depends on the context in which it's activated. Right? Okay? So um, this is one of the arguments why we would want to use a recursive neural net, uh, aside from a recurrent one. 
So when we need specific phrases that we are going to use in another part of the application, and we need to have a representation for them, then it becomes very useful to have a uh, structure and assign uh, some semantics to it. So for example, you have the sentence here, John and Jane went to a big festival, they enjoyed the trip and the music there, right? And let's say you have a question answering system that needs to answer, you know, some toy questions, reading comprehension, which is a very popular task these days, okay? So I want to say, who is they? What is they referring to in the second sentence, right? So here I would like to be able to answer John and Jane. So I need a representation for John and Jane. Right? If I use a recurrent structure, I'm not going to be able to call, uh, get that. I'll be able to get the semantics or representation for the whole sentence, right? John and Jane went to a big festival, but not for the particular constituent, John and Jane by itself, right? I won't be able to get that. But using the recursive uh, structure, I would be able to get that if I can derive it through training, right? And similarly for the other ones here. So where is there? Well, that should correspond to the the noun phrase big festival and the trip uh, should correspond to the action, right, which is a verb phrase, went to a big festival. Okay, so um, there are certain natural language processing problems like anaphora resolution, where for example you want to know who, uh, what, what does a pronoun refer to, so that's uh, down here. I liked uh, the bright screen, but not the buggy slow keyboard of the phone. It was a pain to type work and it was nice to look at. So here the first it might refer to a uh, keyboard, right? So I'm trying to say given the word it, I need to determine that first it is an it that needs to be referred to, okay? Uh, there are some its uh, in uh, English that are not actually pronouns that need to uh, refer to another thing, okay? Uh, so in this case the it probably is referring to the keyboard Right? And then the second it is probably referring to the bright screen. Okay? So when we have uh, specific subphrases or phrases that need to be assigned or used, then the recursive structure is much better. Okay? So I'll stop here and then uh, Uma can take over. As explained previously, a uh, recurrent neural network uh, is helpful to find the linear chain of a sentence, whereas the rec uh, recursive neural network finds uh, we need a topological uh, relation. If you want to find a topological relation within a sentence, we need the recursive neural network of kind. So, um, there we need to find the topological relation, a uh, noun phrase itself can have a uh, a recursive structure in that. The, uh, a noun phrase can be of combination of an adjective with a noun or it can be of uh, 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 a verb phrase may contain, uh, a verb phrase may also contain a noun phrase itself. Uh, uh, for example, <coughs> so in order to find the recursive nature uh, within the um, within the phrase structure and as well as um, to find the uh, link between one sentence to the another sentence. In case of anaphora resolution, we need to um, analyze the previous sentence of the uh, uh, given corpus. So in that case, the recursive nature will uh, play a critical role. <coughs> so here, in order to compute the recursive uh, neural network for the given sentence, we need to find the score. Uh, the score is computed based upon the, um, first we need to analyze the words, then we need to analyze the phrase vector for that words. So what are the possible, um, I mean uh, reasonable combination of the um, words that come together to build the phrase vector. So that we need to analyze in the next level. In the third level, we need to analyze about what is the semantics of that uh, word. How do we identify the semantics, either the surrounding context of the given word or the uh, with the help of the uh, syntactic rules. So based on that we can identify the context or the meaning of the given word. Um, so um, so the, uh, first we need to analyze uh, what are the possible ways um, the two vectors on the mat. So the two uh, word vectors that come together to build the phrase vectors. So we will have a score. Um, score and the uh, word uh, phrase vector. So that combines both on the mat. 
So on is a one uh, vector and the mat is another vector. We need to combine that based on the score. Uh, so the score is computed based upon the semantic representation. What are the possible ways the two nodes can come together by analyzing the part of speech tag? Um, so we can. Um, so this is the um, main uh, equation to compute the score for the uh, for uh, for the recursive neural network. So this is the main definition for the recursive neural network. Here we need to compute the parent vector by concatenating the two child vectors. Here, um, uh, so this is the W matrix C1, C2 are the vectors. Um, so the, we can uh, define the W as. <coughs> W1, W2 and C1, C2 are the candidate vectors where we can write W1, C1 plus W2, C2. So likewise we can compute the parent vector. Uh, after computing the parent vector, so uh, we need to, uh, we need to uh, combine these two based upon the score. So then we analyze, uh, first we, uh, then we analyze the next uh, next vector, the next possibilities. Then we will concare the cat, sat on the mat. Here we concare the cat and compute the score. Then then con concare the sat and on. Then again compute the mat. So likewise you compute the score for uh, each possible combination and identify which score is the maximum occurrence and uh, combine those, um, those words to form the phrase vectors in the next level. After computing, identifying the score in the next level, you um, identify the next possible highest score. Likewise, you um, go on top of the uh, neural network layer, then you will find uh, the final uh, uh, score for the complete sentence. So likewise, we recursively apply the same W matrix for all the levels of the layers um, of the neural network. So this is the basic definition for computing the neural network for the given sentence to pass. Yes, yes, we can use the already existing pass tree by uh, using feature engineering methodology. We can analyze the semantics. Uh, if you want to build, a, this is a simple example to build the pass tree when you give uh, when a sentence is given. How to build the pass tree with the help of recursive neural network? Oh, so so no, no, this is not necessary that we should uh, use only this mechanism to build the pass tree. So here there is no um, passing information available. You're just putting pairs together and trying to yes, trying to find out. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Without knowing anything about this one yes, 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 yes. You're learning both the parse structure as well as the semantic meaning in the word embedding space for each of the intermediate structures. So this is the thing. First we combine these two vectors, find the score and again combine this. So here the cut is the uh, most possible uh, phrase vector. So then we will combine this one. This is the maximum uh, score. Uh, then this this one is the maximum score. In the next stage, if you compute the score, um, if you compute the score, when compared to this uh, this vector, this vector is more important. Hence, we leave this one and we combine this, these two vectors together in the next uh, uh, neural network layer. Again, in the next stage, we compute the um, again compute the score for the. But again, the compared to uh, this uh, score, this is the most uh, uh, higher uh, higher score. Then we will we will compute we will compute this one. Likewise, we recursively apply the same W matrix and the score in all the layers of the neural network, and finally we will get the complete parse tree. Again, uh, the max margin framework is the definition used to find. Uh, uh, the score for the complete uh, sentence here um, uh, for uh, here the this score is the uh, is the score of the entire tree so score of the entire tree is not a single window uh, thing it is a multiple window so if you are representing a single word it will be a single window so if we are representing a complete sentence so we need uh, it is a combination of the score in each node so here x is the given sentence and um, 
here x is the given sentence and y is the parse tree uh, for all um, uh, for all the nodes we need to combine the summation of the score um, score of each node is uh, uh, derived here so uh, the score of uh, the entire t is the sum of the score of each node computed so uh, that is what represented in max margin framework it helps to find the what is the maximum score uh, among the com uh, combination of the words here uh, so the here uh, the similar to max margin uh, uh, equation uh, this is a max margin parsing and the objective is to maximize the possible um, uh, possible word combination to find the parse vectors and to minimize the error combination the best possible uh, phrase structure is identified with the help of this equation here xi um, assume that you have a set of labeled trained corpus uh, with the help of this corpus um, you need to find the maximum so um, for all the sentences, xi is the sentence, ya is the correct parse tree of the given sentence, um, the y that belongs to a of xi is the set of all possible parse tree that is constructed from the given input sentence. So it may also have a wrong sentence uh, parse tree construction may also be there. So it is a um, it, it uh, the size of this uh, set is very huge. Uh, uh, the uh, this delta function helps to find uh, the incorrect decision. So uh, whenever you make any incorrect decision, it will add a bonus point. So um, it will um, uh, add a bonus point and it will increase the error uh, rate. So up to a certain margin, margin um, the value will be error. Uh, the correct decision is after that margin. So likewise, uh, we can compute this uh, max margin uh, framework to find the maximum possible um, pos uh, the maximum value for the given uh, set of uh, words. So by combining the words, we can find the uh, we can maximize um, the possible uh, uh, words and uh, to find the phrase vectors for the given uh, sentence. So again, it is a greedy search mechanism to find the parse tree. Uh, can, can, we, can we get back to the, uh, the page 21, uh, the definition of the score? So yes. I, I'm still unclear about the U. Uh, uh, sorry, U. Uh, 20, 21, 21, page 21. Uh, the sorry. The, uh, the definition of the score. So yeah, uh, score is equal to uh, you are transposed some uh, uh, times p. It's the score. It it is the union of all the uh, node of the tree. Okay, union of the union of all the nodes of the tree. Uh huh. So it's just a linear transform of the score of that. Union transform of that score. It's just a linear transform of the score. P is what p is the output of that. Yeah, that's output of the so we multiply that output cell to a parameter, which is essentially linear transform there is no model, and it output a stone, which is in the diagram. So the neural network has two parameters. One parameter is transforming it to P, and the other parameter is another linear transform of P, which can be essentially represented as A times A multiplied with the linear matrix, to represent one matrix. Okay, P is a non-linear transformation. Okay. So because we have a time h function there. So which is uh, basically you take two smaller the two uh, child vectors and you multiply them and then you apply a non-linearity you get p and then what you are saying is u is just a linear transform of c right it, it's a way to combine all the p's right. to get the overall score for the entire tree so what's confusing me is a p carries on the semantic value here and whereas um, when the uh, after the linear transformation our uh, score carries on Synthetic uh, value, so to define tasks uh, rely on p. So, just uh, you know, I, I didn't get what you are asking. Oh, uh, well, uh, just a p. Uh, the p is a uh, um, you mean the p? Uh, the next one, uh, the p, yeah, the p, yeah, p, yeah, 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 yeah,
value, whereas score can be synthetic. Uh, no. 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 It's just a score. It's just, it's just a score. It's just a way to combine, combine the words. Uh -huh. The possible ways, uh, for for example, have a deal. Okay, so still a uh, semantic. It's more, more, it's more yes. semantic. If you agree, P is semantic, then score is semantic. Score is semantic. Oh, I see. Just the aggregation of P. Let's say it's an aggregation of P. So the uh, loss function j uh, is um, uh, but is evaluated in terms of the semantic. Uh, no. 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 <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can go back to twenty-seven now. Twenty-seven. Okay. It's just based on the parts tree. Yeah. Uh huh. So here, there's two parts of the score, right? There's uh, the first left-hand side, which is scoring um, the notes itself. Mm -hmm. right. And then there's the, uh, the regularizer, which is the second part, the, the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. The right-hand side is saying how good is the structure of the tree that's induced, right? By uh, adding this uh, penalty, this loss delta y comma y i, right? To say how much does the structure of the tree agree with the gold standard part. So this is in training, right? Okay. So you want to make sure that the... the, the what the is the right uh, choice? So in the second part, we find the what is the right choice uh -huh. by ignoring the wrong decision. Uh -huh. In the first part, it combines all the combination. So uh, if we um, minimize the wrong choice, we will automatically get the right tree for the given sentence. Okay. okay. So here, S uh, uh, represents uh, score. Is yeah, it's. Yes. Yes, it's a real number. It will it will give you score. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aggregation. Score. Yes, yes. So the aggregation score is saying how how good are the individual phrases at, at being phrases, right? Okay. Yeah, they're basically looking at all the intermediate nodes and saying each intermediate node, how likely is that a phrase? Mm -hmm. Right, because the score coming out of the recursive node that is telling you the phraseness of the. Next, again, the um, back propagation method. Uh, here, the error message of. So the quality of the tree also depends on the underlying word vectors. Yes. Because if we train the word vectors on Wall Street Journal and try to use it in a, something else like a Singapore News, we probably get a totally different quality. Yeah. Not that bad. Yeah. Just because still news. Maybe if you. Yeah. You use Wall Street Journal and then uh, try to do parsing on biomedical text. Then it will be yeah, something. Yeah, right. So we need to have some consistent word to vector and the parsing they should all be linked or are consistent in the same domain. That would be best. It's always good to train the domain. We can uh, train the um, recursive neural network with the help of back propagation method and always always uh, and as well as the forward propagation method using back back propagation method here again the uh, error uh, signal in one layer um, will pass through the pass from parent vector to the child vector um, again uh, it will be multiplied with the element wise nonlinear function f dash of uh, z uh, so, in order to um, compute the recursive neural network, um, uh, there are three different steps are there. Uh, first, we need to uh, sum the derivatives of W from all the nodes, then split the uh, derivatives at each node and uh, add error message from parent node to the leaf node structure. So, here, um, here. Uh, so, if you use the same W uh, matrix in all the nodes, the function of uh, W, W is a value, X is a value and the, the function of each node is computed. Um, again, if you apply the chain rule um, and get the derivative show, uh, derivatives, so you will get um, in both sides, you will end up with a quadratic equation like this. Uh, if instead of considering only the same W matrix, if you consider uh, different W, W1 and W2, if you apply the same derivatives in that equation, you will end up with the same kind of equation like this. So, um, 
so this is the der uh, derivation uh, uh, used in each nodes of the tree structure uh, then after that uh, now during forward propagation um, uh, the parent is computed using two children likewise um, we need now we need to split the uh, children um, so hence the error needs to be computed with respect to each of them uh, the error message of uh, c1 uh, and c2 is the concatenate the parent error message will be passed to both the candidate uh, child vectors <coughs> still like the normal, uh, normal yes yes yeah. yes uh, then um, the next come uh, the error message of the parent node the delta value of the current node depends on the parent node and as well as its current activation uh, so the error message passes from the parent node and as well as the error message of itself so uh, it combines both the delta score in the uh, pa parent node <coughs> here how to uh, implement the forward propagation and uh, how to implement the backward propagation the uh, in order to implement the forward uh, propagation we need to um, find the node the node activation needs to be computed uh, here the node activation is again the same equation which we have discussed earlier um, it's a stack that contains the left node activation child and the right node activation and the dot product with the word matrix um, plus uh, this uh, bias function again the nonlinear equation uh, after identifying the word vector, we need to um, compute the softmax probability for the given class. So, if you want to classify a sentiment, if you want to do a sentiment analysis, either it may be a positive, negative, neutral, so anything, you need to compute the uh, uh, softmax probability with respect to the given um, sentence. So, if uh, if the in order to identify whether the given uh, words are you or a sentence is a positive or a negative um, we need to find the first we need to find the vector uh, matrix after that we need to compute the softmax so the equation for computing the softmax is here in case of uh, large training data the value will be uh, when we go for probability based approach the value will be high so in that case uh, overflow may occur so we we were we were not able to classify under which class this uh, sentence will come so likewise we we will we will get confusion in order to avoid that we need to um, uh, less the maximum of that uh, node probability so uh, so this will avoid the uh, overflow problem so th th this is what uh, done here so likewise we can uh, for uh, each every combination of the word we need to compute the word matrix for the given uh, phrase vectors um, oh, each phrase vectors will again be matched with the softmax probability to identify whether it is a with respect to a class we will compute the probability using the softmax uh, probability computation this is the back propagation uh, algorithm here as i discussed earlier the error message uh, uh, the error message of a single layer uh, um, neural network will pass through the parent and it will again propagate to the child so this is the equation that compute the um, back propagation method if error is not there uh, if error is there if error is not none means it, it has the error it means that it combines the error message of the parent node and as well as the current node so the delta here is two delta here is computed um, next to the nonlinear uh, element wise nonlinear uh, adi uh, addition then we need to update the word vectors uh, this is the straightforward equation which we have already discussed then um, uh, in case if uh, if the current node is not a leaf node if it is a node that occurs in between intermediately then we need to apply this equation <coughs> so this equation is for uh, computing the uh, node uh, computing the word vector and the probability the for the node which occurs uh, centrally in between somewhere uh, so first uh, we need to compute the outer product of uh, the node which is a stack that contains left child and the right child activation um, then again uh, if uh, it has uh, children then the error signal will pass through the children and recursively apply the same algorithm to the child vectors also 
so likewise we recursively apply the back propagation algorithm for the entire tree Yes, uh, the same W matrix is used for all the nodes, uh, but it will uh, that I will discuss later. Okay. So the optimization, um, I don't know much about this optimization algorithm. <laughs> BF, uh, if anyone knows this, uh, you can explain. BFSG and SGD is uh, de in default available in Python to optimize this uh, backpropagation. And I don't know much about this equation. Uh, if anybody knows, you can discuss. So they are dividing the gradient with respect to the. This problem means non continuous objective uh, problem means uh, when you uh, compute, ma when you find uh, score for each node, uh, when uh, uh, so you. Uh, two combination of uh, the word can uh, form higher score and uh, subtle difference in the tree structure if you find a uh, less uh, less value you will again change the uh, search me mechanism the uh, search will be in an entirely different tree so in that case you will face uh, non continuous uh, objective function uh, so for that uh, we need to um, classify the maximum score and the minimum score so there will be a two kind of uh, tree structure that contains maximum score uh, based trees and minimum score based trees so if you uh, if you find the value uh, with respect to this uh, we can somehow uh, reduce the time required to search the tree Uh, there are two kind of recursive ne neural network is there simple neural network tensor neural network in simple neural network as uh, he asked you know the same uh, w matrix is used to compute the node value uh, so if you use the same w matrix uh, for all the nodes we will have the problem like uh, if you replace a single word with another word uh, for example neg negating negative things like uh, um, not bad means it means that it is good uh, not good means it is bad so it is uh, the single uh, uh, negation may uh, reflect with a different uh, classification so in that case um, this model cannot um, identify that so we need to analyze about the uh, part of speech tags or the grammatical aspects of the given words uh, needs to be analyzed so for for example, a cat, the cat, this cat, that cat, if I give uh, all these combination, the cat is the most predominant one when compared to the uh, determiner which we have uh, used. A, the is not that much important. So that kind of inference cannot be identified with the help of simple recurrence neural network. We need to do some feature engineering uh, to find the score of the node. <coughs> Uh, so here the um, in uh, in case of simple recurrence neural network the same weight matrix is used uh, to identify the composition between one vector to the another vector <coughs> see why we need to synthetically untie the recursive neural network as i already uh, discussed with you there are some other possibilities like instead of a cat you can have the cat that cat this cat so that combination may also occur so in order to allow uh, different composition functionality in a single word um, we can um, we can analyze the different grammatical categories so here uh, this is a uh, standard recursive neural network uh, only contains the um, possible word vectors in case of um, uh, synth synthetically untied recursive neural networks contains the grammatical categories so what are the possible grammatical categories that come together with the given word whether it is a, a cat or a the cat or that cat so that kind of grammatical categories can be uh, considered here as a feature to compute the score so if if the, the computation cost is more time required to compute the score is uh, very high but we can um, the accuracy will be high. So here, here on the left side, you have the same W. Here you have WBC and WAP. 
yes uh, the b c b and c represent the grammatical category if the compositional vector uh, space uh, grammar when you uh, do like this you will come across the problem of uh, um, the speed will be uh, reduced uh, the reason is we need to compute the more uh, um, more uh, uh, combination of uh, grammatical categories in that case uh, um, yes 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 we need a bigger data set uh, if uh, if the uh, training data does not contain the combination of two words uh, then it will not learn that one so automatically uh, we lose it, uh, your model will be weak so in that case we need a uh, more training data in case of recursive neural network this equation also i didn't understand what is given <laughs> uh, Which one? this one uh, compositional vector grammar scores at each node compute by combining the pcfg with uh, surn what is surn uh, su means uh, semantically untied ah, the untied one yeah. syntactically untied sorry mm -hmm. syntactically untied recursive neural network and the principle of context free grammar Probabilistic context free grammar. Oh, probabilistic context free yeah. grammar. I think they are just trying to use uh, the rules in CFG uh, as part of your neural networks. The second, the one code, is like yeah, the uh, second part. The score based on the rule of the grammar, mm -hmm. like E goes to B C. Exactly. And the first one is essentially the parameter multiplication with sort, the two times P. The U times P. Right. There was a U parameter, right? Now it changes to B B C because there will be parameter based on each rule of grammar. Because each rule of grammar will be composed into a different scale. So every language, so uh, if you are familiar with the uh, uh, theory of computation, there is something called uh, context-free grammars. So uh, where you can basically define a particular language using two things. One is uh, you can as there will be a particular language for I'm sorry, I'm uh, for every language you can provide it with. Uh, regular expression regular as well expression. as the grammar, yes, in order yes. to generate the particular grammar. Okay, mm. so uh, using that particular context-free grammar, uh, I mean this the context-free grammar has been used previously in natural language processing by assigning probabilities uh, probabilities to those uh, context-free grammar rules. So one such rule would be something like this. Okay, so yeah, so basically if you are if you find a structure like this in your grammar, you will expand that into B and C. So that's that's what it means. So you can ask, you can actually learn some weights for the uh, grammar to generate uh, a particular language. So they're using that same idea here in neural net, uh, recurrent neural networks to represent the various ways in which the, the cat, that cat are represented. Right. So that's that's your second part. So this part we already know, I think, and I think this is this the second, second part. part. So P of means probability of this particular. Log means we are normalizing the uh, value. Right. I, I think this is just. Uh, this, this, they are taking the log may, uh, for the same reason we take the negative just, log like yeah, 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 right, right. So this, just, this just, P is probability. Yeah, and it's just the probability of that context-free grammar rule firing, right? So if yeah. I say, uh, how many times do I say, do I see uh, a noun phrase made up of a determiner plus a noun phrase? Right? Okay. A noun. So how likely is a noun phrase decomposed into those two parts? Right, where P1 would be a noun phrase and, and B and C would be determiner plus noun. Oh, okay, yes, yes. Okay. Um, we can actually, uh, when we train models, we use some kind of regularization. This can be seen as a regularization over the score of problems. So, because what we are doing is score is score, plus it has a prior. So people use Gaussian prior, people use. This is actually your prior. prior. This is a probabilistic prior from the grammar. We are doing a pass, constitute passing, so the prop, it won't be a Gaussian distribution on the rules, but it will be some distribution which can be statistically done. Yes. There are other uh, related work. Um, so uh, mostly, most of the related work for recursive neural network is attempted mainly for uh, identifying the tree structure, past tree construction, likewise. So 
uh, all the previous approaches uh, they have only attempted using the uh, in order to uh, if you want to find a topological uh, structure from the sentences uh, we need the recursive neural network we can also you um, it is also useful for identifying sentiment uh, sentiment analysis opinion mining so in that case we need to um, pass uh, one sentence um, and also analyze the link between one sentence to the another sentence so that kind of recursive things um, we can use the recursive neural network do you have a demo do you have a demo as part of it no 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 i don't okay. know okay so we can actually see a demo there. if you go to stanford uh, nlp okay they have the sentiment tree pack that's a very nice demo i think even in the start of this lecture the first image is okay Where do you want to go? Sentiment tree band. Ah, uh, okay. It's the paper is called Deeply Moving. Deeply Moving Sentiment. Is it this one? Is it this one? Yep, yes, yep. So what are we looking at? There is a light demo tab. So what do you want us to do? Light demo. Oh. Okay. Yeah, you can just type any text yeah. and then you can generate. Yeah, so it's this is basically what we're talking about. Um, intelligent humor. So each of these is uh, categorized with some mm, mm. positive. I mean, so they get the labels using crowdsourcing, and then they use uh, recurrent neural networks to uh, see the composition and then classify into one of the positive, negative. Things. That's it. You can play around with various sentences. The first comment first comment yeah yeah Uh, in case of uh, in case of uh, statistically untied recurrence neural network gave uh, better performance uh, better uh, accuracy when compared to the normal standard recurrent uh, recursive neural network um, but uh, uh, the other models like the performance wise uh, uh, weak because of the computational complexity the syn syntactically untied uh, recurrence neural network seems required to find the more number of combination grammatical categories uh, to find the score then the computation cost is more but the accuracy will be very high so this is the thing which i have already discussed uh, Uh, learns the uh, uh, syntactically untied recursive neural networks learns the uh, learns the predominant uh, grammatical category so which one is important which one is not important so here uh, the determina np a cat the cat that cat in that case the cat is the predominant uh, um, word uh, i mean phrase uh, when compared to are the and that so likewise uh, this uh, uh, syntactically untied recursive neural network can identify um, learns the soft head nodes what is the Uh, predominant word um, which word is important when you give a phrase 
so in case of verb phrase and uh, noun phrase so both are important hence it is uh, um, shown in a red line but the computation wise uh, the data which we have taken is huge here why Uh, it means that uh, uh, when you the color color is uh, for uh, uh, what are the possible combination of grammatical categories we are matching in order to find uh, infer some knowledge from the uh, corpus so this red color indicates uh, uh, yellow is determiner red color is the np so red color indicate that the np is the more predominant uh, factor when compared to determiner here both are predominant bp and np is more important so likewise we can identify the yes in this experiment they are comparing um, with uh, the standard represent standard one and with the here they have compared the uh, normal recursive so the existing one which are similar to this. So the, the score on the right side. Uh, right side indicate the sentence. test of all sentences. Uh, the, task? the task is parsing. 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 Most okay. most of the work uh, have been attempted only for finding the tree structure and the syntactic nature of the sentence. Um, so if they, if they are able parts. to complete the parser then you assign us. Or is it binary yes or no? So that I don't know. <laughs> Just I am explaining. The score has some um, tree structures. Tree structures. So if we get the entire sentence right, given the unity count. Yeah. So if you get partial unity count, then that will be the Yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're parsing and part of speech tagging because the performance is already so good, you know, in the 80s to 90s. Any amount of improvement is very significant. So, uh, yeah, 5% is really, really big yeah. um, for the difference between the standard recursive neural net and the untied one. Yeah, but uh, yeah, all of those are pretty significant. They're on a large, uh, a large data set. Well, not very large these days. This is the uh, standard Wall Street Journal corpus and, and tested just on the standard WSJ split. So an NLP that's just testing on two sections of the corpus, okay. 21 22. Mm, here, um, in case of uh, identifying the similarity between one sentence to the another sentence, uh, for example, he went to the mall, um, they went to the market, um, they went to the market, uh, he went to the mall yesterday, he, they went to the market last night, um, ch children want to go to market yesterday. So likewise, if you have three sentences like this, um, uh, these three sentences are somehow similar um, with respect to the context. The word which occurs um, are uh, somehow similar. Uh, across the sentences and as well as the semantic is also uh, correct. How to identify that um, semantic either because of the syntactic nature of these sentences may be similar or uh, the words uh, that are surrounded with the given word vector are similar. So likewise we can identify this. So to, to um, uh, identify adjusting the seasonal variation like some uh, so big uh, uh, in case of summary generation, you know, uh, if I give a term um, in a new, if it is a new, new C1 mining, if I give a uh, any bomb blast event, so the sum, in the summary it may have the same kind of uh, sentences, same that uh, describe the same meaning may be there. So if you get all the three sentences, it is not uh, nice. So we need to uh, take the sentence which is the um, that is common optimal sentence that represent that event is uh, required. So in order to identify that we need to um, do some adjustment in the grammatical structure to find the optimal solution of the sentence. So that is what uh, done here. Um, 
so these kind of uh, uh, issues we need to tackle when we apply the recursive neural networks so because uh, we need to um, uh, find the overlapping of the grammatical structure between across the sentences and as well as the syntactic nature contextual feature so all these categories needs to be analyzed uh, so in that case uh, uh, we need to uh, adjust some uh, variations and fluctuations in the sentence yes Uh, this is the which I have already uh, so so if you, you have a training sentence he eats spaghetti with the fork she eats spaghetti with pork the test sentence contains he eats spaghetti with the spoon here uh, he eats spaghetti with spoon and with a fork is uh, same and uh, uh, she eats spaghetti with pork and she uh, he eats spaghetti with meat is same so our uh, learning algorithm should identify the uh, ex semantically similar sentence of the given training sentence so this is the result obtained in the standard uh, parser here he eats a spaghetti with a spoon the with a spoon is uh, connected with the noun phrase which is uh, incorrect because with a spoon means how he eats the uh, spaghetti uh, so it modifies the verb phrase so it needs to be connected with the verb phrase um, so here he eats spaghetti with the meat it, this is the correct one so here it is connected with the verb phrase in the compositional vector space model which is attempted with the help of syntactically untied recursive neural network it correctly uh, classify the spaghetti to the verb phrase because uh, he eats spaghetti with the spoon it means that how he eats the spaghetti so this should be com uh, concatenated with the verb phrase uh, so the in compositional vector vector grammar we can correctly identify the pp attachment problem will not be there Uh, how to label the recursive neural network again uh, it is uh, probably a softmax classifier is used to uh, find the probability of the um, given training sentence so this is the simple ex uh, another example instead of considering only the sentences if you consider an image to id um, to identify the thing uh, here um, instead of uh, considering the um, word vectors and the uh, grammatical aspect syntactic aspect here we consider the region features the image based features are considered in order to combine the two child vectors to the parent vectors and to again combine the parent vectors to form the another vector so likewise here the regions like uh, the trees and the other part of the regions are used and the likelihood of uh, whether to combine these two image of the region to find the parent uh, region so likewise we can um, we can find the image with the help of features that are related to images again this is that 
CRF models are very popular. Yes, yes. Used to be very popular. Yes. Again, um, the regressive neural network, when compared to the existing uh, thing, the accuracy is more. Um, since uh, we have considered the features when computing the score for the given node. A recursive neural network is useful to identify uh, tree-like structure from, from the sentence and to infer the recursive of uh, natural language sentences and um, to in order to find the um, in order to uh, build that model first we need to build the word vectors for that model and compute the phrase vectors uh, and again uh, among this uh, uh, vector uh, vector space representation we need to uh, find the softmax probability to identify the whatever the inference whether you may want to find the sentiment or opinion mining anything uh, uh, with respect to the particular class we need to apply the softmax uh, probability to identify the um, most li uh, likelihood of the given sentence to uh, in a specific uh, sentiment or in a specific opinion. So likewise we can identify the two methods are used one is back propagation and uh, mm, uh, forward propagation. You can apply the recursive neural network in either way. So, so I think one of the main things that we saw in terms of optimization today is that we are optimization. BFGS, right? Uh, yes. So, so we are no longer doing complex optimization I think. Earlier classes we didn't come across LBFTS optimization. I think it, it was still convex optimization. Mm. I don't think it does, no, no, right? No. I hope those are more gradient descent methods. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There are gradient descent methods. Gradient descent methods will. Are they still convex, right? using gradient descent, but you use L, uh, yeah, SG or, or SGD or any other method that the other data grounds. Mm -hmm. We just still feel that what they did about the change of data. Like in SGD, we have paid uh, learning date times the gradient. In uh, SGD with momentum, we use learning date plus a constant times the history of the We essentially take the diagonal of the previous gradient matrix and normalize using the diagonal value of the current gradient, which is essentially saying the scaling of the gradient. Just another way of updating the alpha and hence updating the parameter. But everything updates the parameter by using the group test, some function times, randomly weight times, new group, which can co convex.
Languages uh, uh, which do not uh, follow the word order, morphologically rich languages can use these kind of recursive neural network. Uh, actually, if you if you ignore, if you feel that your language has no word ordering constraints, then constraints. you would be less, yeah. less inclined to use a recursive structure and more inclined to use a recurrent structure, right? right. Recurrent you're structure. Just capturing, you're just aggregating all the words together in the back of words. That's what Cursive is saying there's some, there's a method to the madness, right? There's a reason for placing uh, a word after another word, right? Because I'm composing units that have semantic meaning. Right? So if you have a word with a very strong word order dependencies, um, a little bit like English, English is actually somewhat hard for that, then you would have uh, better results, I think, with recursive. If you have things that are less, less, well, uh, uh, with freer word order, let's say, for example, Japanese, <coughs> the role of the uh, part of a sentence in Japanese is dependent on a particle. And you know, you can move it, and, and if you move things around, it, it just emphasizes different parts of the sentence. Then maybe a, a recurrent word. Oh, it's a good question. I don't know why. Maybe. Uh, because of the amount of data, I don't know. But it does seem to make sense. I mean, we have a lot of data for machine translation. There's one constraint here is like uh, all the <coughs> intermediate vectors should have the same dimension as the word embedding. But in a recurrent neural network, you don't have such constraint. The HD can be of any dimension you want. Uh, does it give some extra freedom to capture? Do you also HD can be of so here, since you are composing, uh, can all those, like you know, the vectors at the intermediate stages, should, they should all because you are taking a word, the word equal dimension. Of yeah, right. But mm. so does it make it a kind of like, a, or you can obviously increase the size of the word, right? Yeah, large as well. Yeah. I think one problem this can't be used in machine translation is because then the original problem of machine translation comes in the face to face. But this is, you are automatically doing it inside your yeah. recursive neural so, network. So then the point is lost. The, 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 complete, the idea of having the phrase information additionally, that is lost because the, I'm going to one that. If by some reason it can use that phrase information and directly match to the target language phrase, then there is some problem. Yeah. But otherwise, this is just another. Thank you. 
because they have to stay one day importing, and that means you import the current language, and after that you translate to another language to a different people. Right. So yeah. So what I understand from uh, machine translation, you have a two stage, and yeah. each stage is uh, the first stage is importing into one vector. But if you want to, if we want to use the recursive neural network for machine so we need to find a way to represent so the same the same structure. I mean Yeah, but you also remember from the last class people were even flipping the sentence as the input. So yeah, I mean when you flip the sentence what's the meaning of the sentence? Basically you are just giving a sequence of tokens and uh, just mapping it. Yeah. So you probably can plug in anything. I mean you can you can jumble the words and it may still get something. Actually, it really makes sense because for the target language, the grammar may be produced in some fashion, and for the original language, the grammar can be produced in some fashion. But the constitution, constituents will more or less remain the same. They will be just produced from a different root of grammar. Right? So yeah. essentially, here we are getting all the constituents. So maybe if we use this in voting, then the decoder can uh, roll back the constituents and replace them with different That should work. Rather than saying that the linear order which was followed in the source language is also followed in the target language, yeah. we can say maybe the constituent is rolled back in some different fashion. So we give a constituent and roll back in the fashion in which the target language is fixed. Yeah, this can be learned from automatically by matrix this. Yeah, because it has equal number of parameters. There was one page shared matrix which ran for all the 